Welcome to everybody and thank you for coming tonight uh, for Audubon's monthly, Yolo Audubon's monthly program. Uh, there's not a lot of news except this weekend is a great backyard bird count. And uh, that's a fun event that we didn't publicize enough. I, I mentioned it when I sent out the notice about this program, but uh, it's just something you can do in your own backyard or down the road or however you want to, and it's this weekend. So if that interests you at all, just go on the National Audubon website and they'll get you to the right place. It's a joint venture of Audubon and Cornell and maybe the American Bird Conservatory. Anyway, it's just a, an effort to get everybody out looking at birds and it's not nearly as formal as the, the Christmas bird count. So I recommend it to people. Uh, if you've seen any good birds in the last month or the last several months, put them in the chat along with any questions you might have as, uh, as Charlie gives his talk and we will uh, deal with them at the end of the program. I did see a note from uh, Manfred Cush today that he had his first Rufus hummingbird, a male, at his feeders and he said it was the earliest he'd ever had one. So mm -hmm. it's a weird year. Yeah. All right, um, let's see, everybody should be on mute and eventually, if you want to turn your video off, but I, I don't think it's mandatory. Our last speaker wanted people to turn their videos back on so he could know that there were people out in the audience, but uh, I think it does help to turn the, uh, the audio off rather. Okay, Ken, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, <clears throat> good evening folks. Uh, Tonight we have Charlie Russell. He's going to talk to us about the wildlife, wildflowers out at the uh, Yolo Baptist Wildlife Area. Uh, some, hopefully, some natives, but uh, most of us know there are probably uh, more non-natives out there, uh, thanks to the wind. Uh, but uh, I think it should be interesting uh, talk because we go out there and we see these flowers. Me, I look at everything, so I'm not necessarily uh, just fixated on birds. Now, Charlie's had a lifelong interest in nature, and he's been photographing uh, wildflowers for over 40 years. Um, he has a, a degree in plant science, um, and he is a docent at the Yolo, um, Yolo Basin Foundation, and as well as, I think, Jepson Prairie. Um, he is just the go-to guy for wildflowers. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Charlie, and he's going to uh, tell us about all those flowers we've been seeing out there. You got it, Charlie. Okay. Well, let's see if I can get my screen going here. So how's that look, Ken? Looks great. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk about the plants in the Yolo Bypass. Um, as Ken mentioned, I'm a docent at Yellow Basin Foundation and several other organizations, Jepson Prairie and uh, NorCal Bats and a bunch of different things. And like Ken, I, I tend to photograph uh, or look at everything when I'm out there. Um, but I have a special interest in wildflowers. So let's see if I can get this to cooperate here. There we go. So I assume that Everybody here is somewhat familiar with the old bypass wildlife area. Um, quite a, a large place, uh, but only portions of this are open to the public. And I'm going to be really focusing on what plants you'll see in the publicly accessible areas, which are the essentially the top third of the bypass. There's some very interesting things down in the southern end, and particularly in the vernal pools, but since that's not publicly accessible, I'm not going to really address it here. Uh, and the, inter the bypass is very interesting because there's a wide variety of plant habitats out there. So we have a, a lot of, you've got riparian and roadside and flooded areas and grasslands, and that gives us a big variety of plants to, to look at. And there's something on the order of 500 species of plants that have been identified in the, in the, in the wildlife area. Of those, maybe roughly 380 of those, very roughly, are native to California. But when you go out there and look at them, 
very often what you're seeing are the non-native plants. They tend to be more abundant, uh, particularly in an area that's that has had a lot of human activity in it, like the bypass area. And I am not going to show you photos of every plant that's out there. Um, I don't have photos of every plant. Uh, and if I even if I did, that would take us uh, a couple of days to go through, perhaps. And I'm not always going to identify the plants all the way to species because a lot of times to identify a particular species of the plant, you have to see some sort of some feature that you can't really uh, see easily that you, you need a, a hand lens to see or uh, you may have to see it at a different time of year with fruit or something like this. So sometimes I'll just take it to, to genus. And I like to point out that all the photos in the uh, show were taken by me in the wildlife area uh, with a few exceptions, which, which will be noted. So let's start off. I'm gonna go through this by looking at different um, habitats that are there. And obviously the, the Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area has a lot of uh, wetland aquatic habitats, uh, quite a variety of habitats from one year to the next. It could be flooded, it could be very dry, we have the agricultural areas, you've got canals. So I'm gonna talk about plants that are primarily considered to be aquatic plants, so be in water. Um, a lot of times when I talk about a plant being in a particular habitat, it could also be in other habitats. It, it, they, they're, they're not necessarily restricted to one particular type, but I'll talk about what they're more commonly seen in. So to start off, an easy one, uh, rice. There is rice in the, in the wildlife area. Uh, we have white rice, which primarily in, uh, in the bypass, they're growing short grain rice, which is the rice you use for sushi or moki. And there's also wild rice. And wild rice isn't really a rice, it's a grass. Um, it's native to the Minnesota area. The, the particular one that they grow out there came from uh, Minnesota. Um, and when you're looking at the fields, it's easy to tell which one you're looking at because the, the domestic rice, the white rice is gonna look like that bottom photo where you have a very even, uniform, nicely green um, field where the rice plants are all pretty much the same height. Where the wild rice, it's gonna be much more irregular. It's, it's a rougher looking um, place, it's, you know, it's, it's wild. Something that you'll see that's very similar to this, uh, there's several species of water grass out there, uh, wa water grass or barnyard grass. It's, it can be tough to distinguish uh, which species there are. These are, they look similar to the wild rice, but once you get, once someone points this out to you, you can see that they aren't quite the same plant. Um, usually we'll see these along the edges of the rice paddies. You'll see them in uh, ditches and, and places where there's uh, water at least part of the year. And this is actually a pest to the, to, for the rice farmers out there because it's very fibrous. It's at, it grows to a different height than the wild rice and the, and the domestic rice. So when they, the harvesters go through there, it has a tendency to, to wrap around the, the harvesting uh, equipment and, get, and tangle things up. So um, something that you'll, you'll see very commonly through this part of the California. I'm sure you've all seen cattails. Uh, there's actually three kinds of cattails that have been identified out there, uh, broadleaf, narrowleaf, and, and southern. Um, some discussion about whether some of these species are, are native or introduced, but we'll consider them to be more or less native. The southern one, I don't have a picture of here. It is a lighter cinnamon brown uh, on, the, on the hot dog on the stick there. I uh, haven't seen very much of that. It's, it's, not, it's not typical out there. The broad leaf and the narrow leaf, um, it's really hard to tell the difference just by measuring the leaves. We're talking about a few millimeters difference and I'm not sure exactly where on the stem we're supposed to measure these things. But one of the tells that you have between the two, you've got the, the thick hot dog part there, which is the, the, the female flowers. You have the male flowers on the, on the thinner spike up above. And if you look on that one on the right, there's a little gap between the male and the female flowers, where on the one in the center, there isn't. And 
typically you'll see that the broadleaf doesn't have a gap and the narrow leaf does have a gap. Now that's that's not a perfect tell, but but it's one way to tell the difference. Um, the Native Americans made extensive use of these plants. Uh, the shoots are edible. The pollen is edible. It has a starchy root that's edible. The uh, fluff from the female flowers can be used uh, to stuff mattresses or for diaper linings. And uh, the leaves are very fibrous, so they could be used for weaving. And it's in a proper conditions, it's a, an amazing plant because the, the rhizomes, this, the underground uh, stems and roots of this thing can grow up to 10 feet across a pond in a single season. Uh, we don't usually see it qu growing quite that fast out at, in the bypass area, but it, it can be a very vigorous grower. Along the edges, usually, of the rice paddies, there are a couple of species of arrowhead. Um, there's actually a, maybe a third species, which I don't list here. I, I'm looking for that third species, but haven't found it yet. Um, these are native plants uh, to North and South America. Uh, native Americans use them because they have a, a, a nice tuber that can be, um, that's very starchy. Uh, you've got two types of flowers here on the same stem where the female flowers are, the, are lower on the stem and the male flowers, which is a, the top picture, are usually higher up in the stem. You can tell the difference between them because they have those uh, arrow leaves on the side. The, the uh, broadleaf arrowhead is the one in the top right, and the, the long-lobed uh, narrow one is, is the other in the bottom. A few years ago, it was the only one I would find out there would be the broadleaf, but I'm seeing more and more of the, of the arrow leaf ones show up these days. Very similar plants to that, uh, burrhead, it has a very similar looking flower. Um, easy to distinguish because they have these, these broad flat leaves rather than the arrowhead shaped leaf. And the arrowheads and the burrhead are native to this area. Uh, the other one that you run into is the lance leaf water plantain. Uh, that's a little different. It doesn't have that arrow shaped leaf. The um, you'll see a, a slight pink cast to the flowers. It's actually a very pretty flower, although they're, they're probably dime sized, they're pretty small. And that's a plant that it, it, while it starts in the water, it'll, it, it grows quite well once the ponds dry down uh, as well. You'll see them uh, sending up flower stalks, um, even in the dry land. And I'm, I'm starting to see lance leaf water plantain uh, in bud out there now, which is, uh, earlier than I would have expected to. And I apologize if I'm going through this pretty quickly, but I'm trying to get this done in the time that Ken uh, allotted to me. Um, in the rice paddies, usually in the corners or places where there's a, um, a gate that goes from one field to another, we'll see the Gila River water hyssop, uh, native to California and Nevada, it's very low growing. A pretty plant. The flowers are probably size of a, of a nickel to a quarter. Uh, you get big masses of them. If in that center photo, the tall stuff is, is either rice or water grass, but all the white and lower part of that is this uh, floating uh, uh, bacopa floating around there. Uh, very pretty plant related to some plants that you'll, you may find in your garden sometimes. If you're a birder, which I assume most, if not all of you are, you've seen tulies. Uh, birds really love tulies. They, there's a, it's a nice native plant. There's a lot of seeds being produced up in the tips up there. Uh, native Americans would use this for uh, build, you could build boats, for baskets. Uh, again, the starchy rhizome, the, the roots are, are starchy and they can use that for food. Um, the one I see the most common is uh, you, I have the, the uh, scientific name for it there. There are some similar plants out there which are not as common, but when you're looking at those, uh, this one has the round stems where some of them may have a, a, a stem that has more of a triangular edge to them. And this one has the, the flowers up on the tips where sometimes you'll see some 
similar species that may have flowers um, on the joints alongside. Um, if you take one of those stems and cut it in half, it looks like styrofoam inside. There's, it's, it's a very uh, puffy uh, material with a lot of air uh, uh, pockets in it. Uh, certainly you can see why they used it for, to make boats or, or things like that. Great, great plant for the birds out there. One that almost certainly you've seen if you've been out there, uh, floating primrose willow. Um, this is probably all of the species that we have out there are non-native. There's some discussion about uh, one of the subspecies might, might or might not be native, but I'm, I'm pretty set on these all being um, not native to California at least. Very invasive plant. You'll see the wildlife managers out there using backhoes to dig gobs of this out of the canals, um, which they stack up along the side of the, uh, on the roadsides because it just is a, grows very prolifically. The um, two species that we see, the hexapetala and peploides, generally to tell the difference, uh, even though it's called hexapetala, you can't go by counting how many petals that it has. The, uh, the peploides has five petals, hexapetala has six petals, but sometimes you find it also with five petals. Um, I look at the leaves, you can see the, the pointier leaves on the top, uh, which should be hexapetala and peploides, which is on the bottom there, they're a little bit more of a spoon shape. But again, there's, there's some other characteristics that you have to use to, to really get them down to species. These plants are really amazing. When those canals dry down, this plant, it looks like it's a, a monster out of, out of some movie it tries to literally tries to crawl out of the drying canals. You see it send runners across the roads, across the, the berms next to it, looking for water. A very pretty flower. Those flowers could be uh, three inches or, or across or more. One that we see um, some years, but not all years, is the common water hyacinth, which may be worldwide, may be one of the most uh, troublesome aquatic uh, pest plants that we have. The, um, it likes more free flowing water. So the only place I've ever seen it myself is in the toe drain, which is the long uh, canal that or waterway that's on the runs down the east side of the bypass area. Um, in years when we have a big flooding event where the bypass fills up with water, it flushes these things out down into the into the delta. And then it takes a couple of years for it to creep back in. And I noticed this year we've, we're getting a pretty good, excuse me, end of last year into this year, we're getting quite a bit of it uh, creeping up the canal up there. Uh, very pretty plant, uh, major pest. Oops, excuse me, I've got, I hit the wrong key, here we go. So you may be looking at a canal and you see this brown scummy surface and a lot of people just kind of discount it. It's, you know, it, it's just a, a bunch of, of crud in there. Well, really what you're looking at very often is a fern, a floating fern, uh, Azola, uh, most likely Folicloides. It's the most common one we see out there. Um, you get a lot of color variations in there, but more often than not, it's gonna be that, um, that olive green to, to drab brown color. The fern's floating on the water. It's got little rootlets that are dangling down, pulling up um, water and minerals. And it has an association with the cyanobacteria. The cyanobacteria lives in these little pockets that are in the uh, leaf fronds. And the cyanobacteria is a nitrogen fixer. So you've got a, a, a symbiotic relationship between this uh, cyanobacteria and the fern where they're uh, mutually assisting each other. This plant is found in many places in, in the world. And in fact, if you look at places in Southeast Asia, they'll encourage this to grow because then when they're, when they're finished with the harvest and, and they let their um, rice paddies dry down, you're adding this, the, this plant to the soil and you're essentially, it's a natural fertilizer because of the amount of nitrogen that these things are fixing. I haven't seen anyone really do, doing that in, in uh, the United States on a, on a regular basis. 
So let's move on and talk about the water's edge. You know, I working with vernal pools like I do, I, I spend a lot of time looking at uh, what we'll call microhabitats. So if I'm looking at that pond in the upper left, you've got, that's, that's one of the uh, shorebird ponds. The bottom of the pond, you've got a certain type of plant that's growing down there. Then on the lower edge of the pond, there's another set of plants. And on the higher edge of the pond, you'll have yet again a different set of plants. And then just behind the edge, out into the grasslands, there will be yet another uh, plant community out there. So a lot of these plants are growing on the edges of places. Um, they may wander out into a little bit uh, on the aquatic side. They may wander out into the grasslands a little bit, but you tend to see them along the water's edge. One that you'll see quite a bit in a bypass, a couple of them are the persicaria. Um, there's lady's thumb and willow weed. Uh, the lady's thumb is considered to be uh, non-native from Eurasia. Uh, the willow weed is considered to be a native, although we find it uh, around the world. And it used to be, when I was starting to work with these um, a number of years ago, I said, okay, well, you got this nice rosy pinky color. That's a lazy thumb, oh, lady thumb, <laughs> sorry. And the uh, lower one, the more, tending more towards white, that would be willow weed. But color isn't really a good way to tell these apart because there's quite a variation in the color of, of each of them. Um, used to be that we'd say, well, there's a spot, a big brown spot on the leaf of the lady's thumb. But as you can see from this picture, that spot doesn't always show up. So the easiest way if you're out in the field to look at them and to get a general idea of what you're looking at is if you look at that lower right photo, the willow weed has a tendency to be nodding. The fl flowers are leaning over and kind of hanging where the lady sun tends to be more upright um, on the average. If you really want to be able to tell a difference, you have to look at the close, uh, take a close look at the stems where the, the, the stem joints there, like that upper right, and see if there are these little fine bristles. Um, we're talking about something that's less than a mil, uh, you know, millimeter or less in size. And if you've got longer bristles, then it's lady's thumb. If there's fewer, very, very short bristles, it's willow weed. Um, that's not something I spend a lot of time uh, uh, worrying about. Um, they, the plants have very similar habitats. They look very similar. They, they fill similar um, niches in, in, in the bypass. The uh, lady's thumb leaves are supposed to be edible. They can contain a chemical called persicarin, which is being studied to see if it has some medicinal properties. Um, it's, it's supposed to be able to um, help with the liver inflammation uh, that a diabetic may, may develop. Um, so there, there's some research going on there to see if there's some beneficial uh, uses of this plant. A couple of sedges that we'll see, the most common ones are tall flat sedge and yellow nut sedge. Um, the tall flat sedge is, is native to the Americas. The yellow nut sedge is found worldwide. Uh, generally, you'll find that these have triangular stems. You can see there's a, uh, a difference between the, the flower head and the seeds of, of these plants. Um, the tall flat sedge is considered to be a bit of a, a pest uh, to the uh, rice growers because it does tend to encroach into the, the rice plants and it's very, very fibrous. So it, uh, again, it, it tends to tangle up the, um, the harvesting equipment. The yellow nut sedge is really interesting. This is probably potentially the oldest cultivated plant known to mankind. They, fi they find evidence that this was cultivated back in prehistoric times and it, as well as in ancient Egypt. And in fact, in ancient Egypt, it was an important food source. Um, the, um, it has edible tubers, which some people will call earth almonds or tiger nuts. So, it's interesting when you have plants that have, we, we're looking at plants now that have had a very long history um, with people. Toothpick weed, um, Amoebas naga, which is getting renamed to another, um, uh, being changed over to Visnaga dalcoides. 
a lot of people will some years you see a lot of it last year we saw a lot of this along the waterways as well as along roadsides and uh, toothpick weed because uh, that uh, when they dry out, you see that center bundle of, uh, looks like a bundle of toothpicks there. A lot of people have been call, saying that there's Queen Anne's lace out there. And you see a lot of reports of this. And they're really, they're confusing this with Queen Anne's lace. They look very similar. Um, I have, I spent a lot of time out there looking for Queen Anne's lace. And I haven't, in, in four or five years that I've been really focusing on this, I haven't found any of that out there. It's all this particular plant. Uh, the Queen Anne's lace, the, the differences are gonna be that the seeds are gonna be a little hairy. Uh, the stem, if you look on the lower right, the stem below the, the inflorescence is gonna be hairy. And everyone I found out there is very, very smooth. Um, it is a, a non-native one. Um, it has medicinal, uh, capabilities. The ancient Egyptians made a tea out of this to treat kidney stones. And it hasn't been studied in, in human um, physiology yet. There have been studies on rats that show that, it, yes, it does seem to have perhaps some uh, ability to help uh, with kidney stones. The problem is when you have plants like this, plants don't just make one particular type of, of chemical. They'll generally make several different things mixed in there. And the problem with, with using this plant in a, in a casual basis is that there are other compounds that are in there. There's some muscle relaxants and, and things. So if you take too big of a dose of it, um, it could slow your heartbeat down to a, to a, a dangerous level. A plant that we're seeing more and more often in the wetlands, and in fact, we're seeing uh, reports of this being uh, um, becoming a major problem in many parts of the United States. There, poison hemlock, plant from the the Mediterranean. Um, all parts of this plant are toxic and can cause respiratory or, or and renal failure. Um, one good way to identify it, the the flowers look somewhat similar to the um, ME that we showed you before, the toothpick weed and several other types of plants. But one, one good way to identify this is to look at the stems and they have that, like you see on the right, there's that purple modeled uh, uh, um, pattern to it. Pretty, if you see that, you're a very good chance that it's poison hemlock. Um, you have to be, it's not something you have to worry about handling too much, but um, the, someone ingests perhaps six to eight leaves of this is enough to be fatal for an adult. So it's not something that you want to be playing around with. Um, in keeping with my tend tendency towards uh, dangerous plants here, we have a couple of species of nightshade, American black nightshade and, and black nightshade. There's some discussion about whether maybe these really aren't two separate species. They're really hard to tell apart. And I've seen some people saying it's it's really it's just it's really one species. Um, the green berries, the leaves themselves, are toxic. Um, they give you cramping, diarrhea, and create um, cause vomiting. Uh, children, uh, it can cause death. On the other hand. The ripe berries, there are people that will use the ripe berries in stews and desserts because the toxin levels are supposedly much lower. Now, one of the problems with this is that there's a, this plant is very variable. If we went down to the Bay Area, for example, and took some of these ripe berries, you may find that down there, for example, the, the toxin levels may be very low and, and, and the plant's not a problem. You can go to up to Lake County, perhaps, and take the same plant and the toxin levels in the right berry may be high enough to create some problems. So um, I'm, I'm not a person who goes around eating uh, plants out that I find out in the wild. Um, I would be very cautious with this. It's a good way to get into argument with some people. There's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, no problem. Uh, go ahead and eat it and other people that uh, can get very sick. Um, live, it's not good for livestock. Life, there's high nitrate level, nitrate levels in the leaves, and that causes some problems for 
for cattle and such. You'll find this plant along the edges of the of the uh, ponds, uh, usually kind of hiding underneath some other plants. Now, I mentioned earlier that I, I really focus on native plants. And those are the plants I prefer to find. And this is a non-native one, but this is one I'm always happy to find. It's, it's not really invasive. Velvet leaf is the most appropriately named plant I can think of. Those leaves are just soft and velvety. They're just, they're just a joy to handle. Um, the flowers are not really obvious. They tend to be, be hanging underneath the leaves. They have a very distinctive uh, seed capsule, like you can see there, and these uh, really interesting little heart-shaped seeds. Birds really love it. I don't know if the bird if it provides good nutrition for our native birds, but the birds will um, come to this anytime they find it. Um, the leaves. Uh, the plant is cultivated in, in Asia. It, is, it, it has strong fibers. The leaves are edible. The seeds are edible. Um, the leaves have some medicinal uh, capable, uh, properties. There is a, a chemical called rutin, which is um, used as a soothing lubricant for, for, to, to soften irritated skin. Um, so that, and if you ever feel one of these leaves, you, you can understand where that comes from. We're seeing more and more broadleaf peppergrass growing in the bypass. And in fact, um, from this very invasive plant is becoming a problem in more and more uh, wetland areas in California. Um, I don't know that there's a really good control for it yet. Um, it does really outcompete native plants very well. Um, these, these will grow three, four feet tall easily. Um, in Areas like in the Himalayas, uh, this is a food plant. The leaves have a very pungent, hot flavor, but you have to spend a lot of time treating the, the plant to, to get it to a stage where it's edible. Um, really unfortunate, we're starting to see this uh, in many, many uh, wetland areas. So there's purple aster types of plants. There's uh, at least three species out there. And one of the ways I can tell the difference between them is by using this precision measuring device that I'm showing in the picture. The um, annual salt marsh aster, which may or may not be a native, depending on, on who you want to talk to, uh, small flowers, much smaller than the tip of my finger there, uh, a taller plant, very rangy type of plant. Uh, the ones at the top, the Pacific aster and the Suisun marsh aster, are really, really difficult to tell apart. Uh, generally, we think of the Pacific aster as being a more or less a grass, grassland type of plant. And the marsh aster is one that you'll find um, along edges of, of water in intertidal areas um, in places like this. But in the bypass area, we've got this mix, mix of, of grasslands and wetlands all mixed together. And it's really hard to tell them apart. Uh, the Susan Marsh Aster is a, a very rare plant found pretty much only in Solano and Yolo County, maybe, maybe nearby. Um, Pacific Aster is fairly common. And I get into some pretty good arguments with some people about individual plants. I take photos of um, whether it's one or the other. The, the differences are just really hard to describe in, in, uh, with any accuracy. But there have we see them quite a, quite a bit, um, especially in the drier areas uh, around Greens Lake, uh, for example. So now I want to move on to uh, grasslands and dry ponds. And from my view, the the drying ponds and drying canals are actually fairly similar in some ways to an open grassland. A lot of the plants will move into these uh, dry ponds, um, particularly the the, um, the uh, shorebird ponds and, and these as they dry out uh, early in the spring. And so it's a very similar habitat there. One of the plants that you'll, anyone who's a birder is, has probably come across this if you're out there um, in the drier areas, pennyroyal. 
Uh, Penny Royal is not native. It's it's from the Mediterranean, like so many of our uh, uh, non-native plants around here are. Uh, the oil has been used as an insect repellent for uh, uh, for many uh, in many cultures. Um, you walk through a plant; it doesn't even have to be flowering. You know it's there if you walk through a field because you'll smell it. A very, very strong minty smell. Um, supposedly there's a, a native mint in the bypass area, but I have not been able to find it. Um, and the native mint is very, very similar to this one. Um, but you have to be careful because people do use the leaves of this in teas um, as flavorings, but the oil itself, if you extract the oil, the oil is extremely toxic. Uh, one tablespoon of the oil of this is, is, can be fatal. It can cause seizures, uh, cardiopulmonary collapse, acute liver in, in, um, injury, uh, renal failure. And in fact, this plant, the oil of this plant was used to induce abortions by the ancient Greeks. So it's not something that I'm going to be fooling around with. I don't, um, I'm not so big on making tea out of this myself. Generally, I have less interest in looking at grasses. I, uh, being a photographer, I like to go for the showier things. But um, this particular grass is is worth mentioning. It is a non-native one, uh, swamp prickle grass or swamp timothy. timothy. It's got several different names. Uh, it's not native. It's from Europe. But this is one that the wildlife managers are really happy to see, and they really encourage this to grow in the uh, shorebird ponds and the, the, the duck ponds, the shallower ponds. It produces a lot of seed. It's very, it, it grows very easily. It grows when things are dry out there very well, puts down a lot of seed. And when you see the, the dabbling ducks out there uh, sticking their nose down in the water, a lot of what they're eating is gonna be this particular um, plant. So it's very beneficial uh, food stuff for, for birds out there. Um, very short plant. We're talking about grass that's that's you know three four inches tall at the most. There are a large number of grasses out there, and a large percentage of these grasses are non-native grasses, primarily from the Mediterranean. Um, California has a Mediterranean uh, climate. Uh, a lot of the European settlers that came over here came from the Mediterranean areas, and when they brought their their uh, seeds like the you know the rye grass and barley and wheat and things were that came over in the 1800s from Europe. In those days, they didn't know how to clean their seed really well, so they brought a lot of weed seeds along with them, and essentially they planted hundreds of thousands of acres of of uh, whatever grains they were trying to uh, to grow in the Central Valley, and we have what was essentially the world's largest weed garden. Uh, so a lot of these uh, plants are not native. There are a few native uh, species of, of the barleys and canary grass and, and, and things out there. Um, I don't get into trying to identify them because it's really tough. And the nomenclature used to describe grasses is very, from a botanical sense, is very different than for a lot of the other the flowering plants. The Italian rye grass, uh, the ranchers in, that have the the people that have the ranching lease in the southern part of the bypass area, very happy to see that. That's a very nutritious plant for cattle grazing. If you got cattle, you like that. Um, that's probably all I'm going to say about grasses here. Another plant that you'll see a lot of um, in the area, unfortunately, is cockleburr, and cockleburr is the direct opposite of the velvet leaf that I talked about earlier, those leaves are feel like sandpaper. They're very, very rough. The, um, there's some thought that this may be the plant that inspired uh, the Swiss electrical engineer, George de Mestrel, to create Velcro back in the 50s um, with the, the hook and, and catch um, structure you see there. Um, it's not clear, Cockleburr did grow in the area where he lived, but there's also another plant which may be more common called burdock, which also has um, 
similar types of structures. So it's hard to say which one was the inspiration for Velcro. Um, in any case, if you walk through there, uh, you'll you'll certainly find it because uh, it'll grab onto your socks or your uh, or your sweater very easily. Um, it does the seeds and the young shoots do contain significant concentrations of some very toxic chemicals. So it's it's something that the wildlife managers aren't really happy to see out there. We don't like to see it where there's any uh, cattle or sheep grazing either. Um, not a plant that I'd worry about um, just from touching it. And if you ever feel this thing, you're never gonna eat it, but be aware that it is another poisonous plant. Flat-faced Dunningia. This may be my favorite flower of all. It is a native plant. It's found only in California. We typically see it in vernal pools. And the, um, the shorebird areas, the duck, duck ponds out there, act very similarly to a vernal pool. They hold water for a long time. It suppresses a lot of, of non-native plants. And in some years, you get these massive displays, acres of this, and more than I've seen in any other location that I've been to. Um, the plants are very short. Um, you know, we're talking about five or six inches tall. Um, we, so they are annual plants. And when you have annuals, you do sometimes get um, um, genetic mutations that, that show up. So we, uh, in the bypass, we have uh, a couple of patches where you'll see these white variations, um, sometimes some pink ones there. And I've seen the, the white variations and, and some of the pink ones in other areas, but usually you'll find just one or two plants. The best place to find this white variation is in the Yolo Bypass wildlife area. Now that photo up there in the upper right, that's the, the ponds that are just south of parking lot A. There's also a good patch that shows up some years on the east side of parking lot A. And I want you to keep in mind, look, looking at that picture, this is in um, perhaps May um, of a year that we had a good some good rainfall. And looking at that picture, now we're gonna flip over to that upper right hand corner is the same area the same year, probably four weeks later, more or less. I don't have a, a time on that. Uh, Daughter is a parasitic plant. It has essentially no roots. It only has roots for a short part of, this, of its life. Well, it's at this stage, there's no roots, there's no chlorophyll. It is completely parasitizing the plants that are there. The um, downingia have all gone to seed and the flowers are gone and this plant is just taking over. It's unusual in many areas to see large ex expanses of it. The bypass is a really good place to see these massive amounts because this is a plant, um, it's a plant that I worked with when I was a graduate student. And uh, it, um, so I have some familiarity with it. The, um, it can spread vegetatively, which means when they go out there and they're disking or mowing these fields, they're essentially chopping this plant up into bits and pieces and spreading it over a, a larger area. Um, really interesting plant. It's, it's, um, it's annoying when it gets to be that thick, but um, it is a native plant. Really hard to get these down to species. Um, generally, I don't, you have to have a hand lens usually to and see um, some structures that don't show up there easily. Plants that you'll very commonly see out there in the summer, um, the two, uh, two vetches that we have out there, the more, one we see more commonly is the hairy vetch that's down on the bottom. Um, we'll also see spring vetch out there. Now these are non-native plants, but they were brought in intentionally. Um, they're used in Europe as a cover crop. And so the, um, as the Europeans came over, they brought this over, they, they are nitrogen fixers. In fact, if you look at the Conaway Ranch to the to the north of Davis, um, there are several fields. Uh, and sometimes when I've seen them, where they've seeded it with uh, spring vetch and some other ones to try to improve the soils. The um, many 
areas in California have soils that are that are um, low in nutrition, low in nitrogen, and the plants that are native to those areas have adapted to growing in situations where nitrogen is low. These plants are nitrogen fixers. They're imp they're adding nitrogen to the soil, which actually is not to the benefit of our native plants. It encourages the non-native uh, plants to grow, and it doesn't really help the the native plants that don't need that much nitrogen. So these the Hairy vetch in particular, I'm, I'm finding in certain vernal pool areas is moving in and, and creating problems for a lot of our native plants there. So now I want to talk about roadside plants. And there's, there's something about roadsides that encourages certain types of plants to grow in abundance. Um, right in the road, maybe alongside the road, um, they tend to be drier, there's you know, different uh, uh, mineral uh, content there in these areas. And I'm cheating a little bit. That, that picture in the lower right is not in the public area of the bypass. That's, that's in the vernal pool areas that glide to a ranch. But that nice yellow stripe right down the middle, that's a gravel road leading out to the vernal uh, pools. And a couple of years ago, we have this, um, this plant, Trifusaria, which is uh, called butter and eggs in this area. Uh, just decided that they that was the right place for them, and there was an amazing, amazing display of these flowers. Um, so one of the plants that I hope that you do not run into out in the bypass area, and over the last couple of years, I've come across it several times, uh, puncture vine. It's um, a non-native that was first found in California in 1902. Uh, they Generally, it's, it's been uh, controlled by an introduced weevil. It's one of the um, USDA's uh, success stories. They brought in a, 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 an insect to, to uh, limit the, this plant, and that insect didn't decide to go off and eat something that was native. The, um, the seeds are structured in such a way that no matter what, what, how they fall on the ground, there's always one of those spikes pointing straight up. They're incredibly hard. They're enough to, certainly enough to puncture a bicycle tire. Um, if you drive across them with your car, there's a reasonable chance that you may get a puncture in your car tire as well. That picture in the lower right, uh, that's the bottom of my boot where I stepped on some of them and the seeds became embedded. I had to get a pair of pliers to get those seeds uh, and, and their spikes out of my boot. So hopefully you won't see this. Um, when we see it out there in the bypass area, um, we try to get it, try to get it and get rid of it as quickly as we can. Um, I've seen this in parking lot C. Um, a lot of times they're uh, close to where the where the porta potty usually is. Uh, down in the Hunter check-in station, there's a, there's a there was a good patch of that a couple of years ago. Um, hopefully we've gotten rid of it, but it seems to come back. One of my favorite um, scientific names, very descriptive, Tribulus terrestris. Wild radish, there's a couple of species of wild radish that we see out there. Um, I used to think, when I started working, looking at these, I thought that, okay, well, the yellow ones are one species and the white and, and pink ones are different species. The problem with this is that these plants hybridize very much. So you'll find a lot of color variations. Um, so it's, it's hard to separate them. Typically we look at the seed pods to see what the, whether they're constricted around the seeds or not to be able to identify one over the other. Um, but by the time I'm looking at them, when they're nice and flowering, there's not a lot of seed pods. So it makes it difficult. Now here's another plant that has a long association with people. This has been, um, people have been using this type of plant and they've been breeding this type of plant for years. So what you have are uh, people have bred these to become um, garden crop plants. The Rafanus sativus, the one on the top, uh, a subspecies of that are gonna be your green and red uh, radishes in your garden. Another sub, uh, a subspecies of the yellow one in the bottom, that's your daikon radish. So um, 
get plants that have been a long time in association with people, they typically have found ways to, to breed these into something that's useful in the garden. Another plant you'll see quite often uh, when things get warmer along roadsides, uh, chicory. Again, a plant that has, uh, it's from the Mediterranean, has a long association with people. Um, some folks may recall that uh, chicory roots were used as a coffee substitute. Um, you wouldn't use this particular one as a coffee substitute, but there is a, a cultivated subspecies of this that is, that is used for uh, as the coffee substitute. Another subspecies of this is your uh, Belgian endive. So again, plants with a long association with people that have that have um, been bred into uh, uh, useful plants. A common sunflower. We see a lot of sunflowers out there in the summer, and I used to think that the summer the these sunflowers were just escapees from the sunflower fields uh, around uh, that we see so often around Davis. Well, about two years ago, I met a retired uh, sunflower specialist from the USDA, and he's telling me, no, really, the, the ones we see out in the bypass are the native ones. They're not, um, there's no genetic markers in here for, for the, that show that they're the cultivated ones. So they are a native plant. There's actually maybe a couple of different sunflowers out there. You can't really identify them easily from the front on shots like this. You have to look at some other aspects of them. Um, I help out with the bat tours that we have uh, in the Yellow Bypass. So we're out there in the evening. And when we're waiting for the bats to come out as the sun's setting, if there's sunflowers around, I'm always looking at the sunflowers looking to see if there are any longhorn digger bees. The female digger bees spend the night in burrows that, they, that they've dug in the ground. They're a ground dwelling native bee. The uh, males are look, don't get, aren't allowed inside the, the burrows. So they cluster on the sunflowers. And these are the bachelor pads. So you'll find them, uh, the, the bees are sitting there just, just resting, waiting for the evening to come. Um, they have this very distinctive long uh, antennae there. It's kind of fun to find those. Uh, dog fennel or mayweed, um, also sometimes called stinking chamomile, although that's probably really a different plant. Uh, we'll, some years we see a lot of this, some years we don't. Um, has a very resinous smell, very, very noticeable, very bright, pretty flower. Um, in the northern, in the public areas of bypass, it's not a real problem. Um, down in the, near the vernal pools and the grasslands, it's, it's gotten well established down there and it's, it's a bit of, a, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a bit of a problem down there. Gumweed or, or gum plant. This is a nice native plant. Um, there are reports of three or four species of gum plant out there uh, in the bypass, but so far in my examinations, I've only found this one particular one. I think that a lot of these other reports are, are um, some mistaken IDs. Um, the um, a Native American the Native Americans use this as a medicinal plant. The, uh, the gum, you can see in the lower left on the, on the bud, there's some uh, a gummy uh, exudate there. Uh, that is used as a, um, to treat lung congestion as an expectorant. Um, the problem with this, if you, you really have to understand your native plants, if you can use them um, uh, for medicinal purposes, because there is, um, uh, possibly a mild hallucinogen uh, in mixed in there. So uh, it may help you clear out your lungs, but it may also give you some bad dreams at night. Um, you really have to understand how to use the plant. This is a perennial one. So we actually, we, I can find flowers out there almost year round for this one. There's a lot of different mustards out there. I'm not going to try to tell you how to identify all the different mustards to, to, um, to species. Um, 
all the yellow mustards out there that I've found so far are non-native. The um, uh, there is a white mustard out there which is native to California. It's really unusual to find it, but sometimes it crops up. But here again, here's a plant that has a long association with people, and these plants have been used and then bred into uh, to into be used in different purposes. Um, one of the species in there, the um, Charlock mustard, um, was used in during the Great Famine of Ireland. Uh, they boiled the leaves. It was a, a replacement food. The problem with that, of course, is that the boiled leaves will give you an upset stomach as well, but that's uh, better than, than starving. Um, that particular plant, the oil is from the seeds used for lubricating machinery. Uh, a couple of other ones in there have edible leaves. Uh, the black mustard is the considered to be the original condiment mustard. The seeds were ground up to make your mustard for your hot dogs. It's falling out of favor nowadays because the seeds are actually kind of hard to process. So they're moving over to some other, uh, commercially they're moving over to some different species of, of mustards. The Brassica rapa, the field mustard is interesting because there are many different subspecies of this that have been, uh, have been bred. Um, bok choy, Napa cabbage, uh, your cultivated turnips are all subspecies of Brassica rapa. Um, quickly, we'll see white sweet clover. I've seen a lot of that. It's really starting to bloom out there, white sweet clover and yellow sweet clover. Uh, there's actually a couple of species of white of yellow sweet clover out there, but the one I see most commonly is white sweet clover, uh, three or four foot tall sometimes, um, non-native from Eurasia. There are, are three primary thistle plants we see out there. I'm not a fan of thistles. Um, they're a pain when you're trying to walk through um, the areas and, and we most commonly see, we'll see them in the roads and pathways. Um, but they're easy to tell apart. The milk thistle looks like curdled milk spilled on those leaves. Bull thistle has the broader leaves but without that curdling. And the Italian thistle has longer, thinner leaves and smaller flowers. Now the bull thistle, if, if um, that's the national plant of Scotland. So if you look at the Scottish crest, you'll see that, that typical flower. Um, the thistles do produce a lot of seeds and are generally considered to be um, uh, good for birds, uh, although I'm not sure how, nutri what, what, how nutritious they are. Uh, milk thistle, you'll find extract of, of, of the seeds in your um, natural food stores. Uh, supposedly good for liver elements, but I've not found any scientific proof that it actually uh, does any good, but it's very popular in the, in the natural food stores. Um, Italian thistle is becoming very invasive in grasslands, so it's causing a lot of trouble for uh, if you have cattle. Mallows. Um, actually, don't often talk about this one, but for some reason, this particular year is going to be a really big year for mallows. They're growing all over the place. They like the particular rain regime that we've had this year. Um, a little bit difficult to tell the bull mallow and the cheese mallow, cheese weed from each other. Um, the fl flowers are a little different, but it's hard to describe sometimes. Uh, the seeds, the way the, the sepals wrap around the seeds is a little different. Um, they're both non-native. Uh, the, bull, the bull mallow was, was used, um, uh, was a food stuff to help the people in the battle for Jerusalem in 1948. They, they boiled the um, bull mallow leaves to get them through the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem. Um, alkali mallow is a native one. You'll see this on exposed areas usually. It's very, very low growing, um, just a few inches off the ground, um, where some of the, the bull mallows, they can get, they're already up uh, three foot tall in some areas uh, out there right now. This one we'll see a lot of, this is my favorite common name and I'm not gonna to try to describe why, where that name come from. I, I, I have no idea what, what the name is. Turkey tangle fog fruit, very low matted type of plant, very pretty flowers. Um, you have to get down and look at it because it's low to the ground and the flowers aren't all that big. Um, this is a, actually there's a, a commercial cultivar of this 
that's a good ground cover. Uh, I use it in my front yard. Um, does very well with very low water. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit too vigorous. It's starting to climb over um, some of my bushes. So I spent a lot of time actually trying to trim it back, but a very, very pretty uh, native plant around here. Uh, yellow star thistle, I think everyone who lives in California, uh, at least in the valley, has seen yellow star thistle. Um, in North Africa, where this is native, it's not a big pest. There are fungi and insects that keep it un in, in, under control. Those fungi and insects don't exist in, in California, so this plant is taking over grasslands. Um, millions of dollars have been spent in trying to control this plant. Um, if you have, uh, it's a real problem for grazers, but it's particularly for, it's a problem for horses. Um, those spines break off when they chew on them and they, they get to a point where they just, the animal just doesn't want to eat because their mouths are so sore. Um, on the other hand, it's considered to be a very good um, pollen and nectar source for bees, particularly for, for um, uh, European bees. And it has a very deep tap root. So the idea is that it's, it's, brings up micronutrients from very deep in the soils up to the surface, which is beneficial for some things. Um, keeping up with uh, poisonous plants, we do have jimson weed out there, a couple of different uh, varieties, uh, one which is uh, not native to this area, one which is native to California, not really sure it, it should be is con considered native around here. Uh, a little bit difficult to tell them apart um, until you get used to them. Um, all parts of this plant are toxic. They contain uh, tropane alkaloids and scopolamine and atropine and uh, uh, hallucinogenics, uh, delirients. Um, it's not something that you're going to use to get high on, to have a, a to, to trip out on, because the chemicals that go along with it uh, are going to, the side effects are going to be really hard on you. We'll see this out in the, the airstrip uh, near the elbow um, uh, east of parking lot B, between parking lot B and C, there's, there's a, some pretty good stands of it out there. Um, bindweed, don't spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, the only bindweeds that I've found out in the bypass are the non-native uh, convolvulus avensis. Um, Back in the 70s, this was probably the plant that the most money was spent on trying to control. Um, it, it, it can take over a field. It it's, uh, uh, can choke out grasses and forbs. It um, is really a major, uh, it's, it, it poses a big threat to restoration efforts in riparian corridors uh, in California. Um, it's, threats have been take, overtaken by some of the other plants that we've seen now. There are several different yellow composite type of plants that look very similar. The flowers look very similar. Um, we've got bristly ox tongue, south, a couple of different south thistles, and a couple of wild lettuces. But you need to look at the leaves. The bristly ox tongue, you've got that lance-like leaf with the little spikes all scattered along the leaf. The south thistles, the common south thistle doesn't have the spikes, has that interesting shaped leaf there in the, in the center left. And then there's a bristly ox tongue, which has uh, spikes all along the edges rather than the, the bristles on the, like the ox tongue. The wild lettuce, a lot of, of, of uh, thorny uh, types of things along the stems and an interesting leaf. Um, they can be difficult to tell apart until you get used to them. Um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I'm running out of time here. Um, this is your prickly lettuce that you'll see a fairly spindly, tall, tall plant, uh, usually a lighter yellow, a couple of species out there. Um, the south thistles, uh, we're seeing south thistles blooming already out there. And the prickly south thistle last year between parking lot A and B along the roadside, there are masses of, of that out there. Um, uncomfortable plant if you get close to it. And the bristly ox tongue, they tend to be a really rattier looking plant. I tend to see them blooming later in the summer, um, but they have that, that interesting leaf. 
And with that, um, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, present this information to you. Again, we, I talked about a very small percentage of, of the plants. Um, if you're interested, I do have a couple of websites where I display uh, my flowers, although I'm more spending a lot of time on the prettier ones. And in Facebook, I have a, a page where I display information uh, on plants that I'm finding. So with that, Ken, are there any questions? Yes, there is at least one. There's lots of comments um, about, about the uh, plant, such as the, oh, I think it was the pepperweed. Now it was called a buttonweed. Do we have a weed out here in California that's called a buttonweed? Um, not one that look, that comes to mind that looks like that particular. Okay one um common names are a little troublesome because right. different people use different names for them there's right. there's one plant that i that where i grew up we called it one thing and then i came over to this side of the valley <laughs> i grew up on the other side of the valley it has a totally different name and i got in an argument with about someone we didn't realize we were talking about the same plant yeah uh people have uh expressed their <clears throat> experiences with the puncture vine I growing up, we call them bullheads because they, they love bike tires. Yeah, bullhead, goat's head, uh, cal caltrops is actually a different plant, but we call, we hear it called caltrops sometimes. Yeah. So someone did ask, uh, are there any attempts to eliminate or control the invasive plants? Not that I'm aware of. There's, there's, it's really not going to work very well out there because every time that floods, you're bringing in a million. Uh, you know, millions and millions of, of weed seeds from the north come down with the flood. Right. Um, so there's just, a, and how are you going to control, a lot of these things just, they're chemical control. We can't go out there and be spraying chemicals out there across things uh, in the, in a wildlife area. So they're, they're, the only one that I've seen any significant effort to control has been the puncture vine. Um, yeah. As far as I'm aware. And and mechanical controls for the for the yellow uh, water primrose where they dig the stuff out of the out of the canals. Okay, uh, someone said you mentioned butter and eggs. Are there other annual wildflowers out there that you did not mention? <laughs> well, like I said, there's there's 500 <laughs> species of plants. So 300 of them are are, yeah. are native. So yes. Um, when I when I say 500 plants, I'm counting the entire bypass area. Right. Um, down in in Glide Tool Ranch, where I know you've you've been to, um, there's a whole set of different plants that are down there, and a lot of native plants down there that are quite beautiful. And um, I'm hoping that later this spring, if you're a member or a volunteer with the Yellow Basin Foundation, um, I'm hoping that we're going to have an open house. Um, unfortunately not open to the public, just open for members uh, at Glide Tool Ranch um, sometime the end of March or maybe early April, uh, depending on, on how things go. It's a wonderful place to visit. Yeah, sure is. Um, okay. We talk, you mentioned lots of poisonous plants, lots to me. Uh, are plants poisonous to people toxic to birds, wildlife, when you say they're toxic. You tried to point out the ones that are toxic to people. You know, I, um, I apologize since I am speaking to the Audubon Society. I'm, I'm not a birder. I'm not familiar with any plants being, uh, whether they're toxic to, to birds or not. Um, there was some discuss, discussion of the toothpick weed that it might be toxic to birds, but I haven't been able to find any documentation of that. Mm -hmm. um, a knowledgeable botanist was telling me that she thought that was the case. Um, I know it's toxic to dogs, but um, I tend to, to think about, uh, it's easier to find information about toxicity in relation to people. Right. Uh, and to some degree also to, to uh, farm animals like uh, cattle and sheep, since we do have cattle and sheep uh, out there in the southern portion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I've begun to wonder about the, the toothpick plant back when I thought it was Queen Anne's lace. 
uh, and I've, I've watched many um, wasps, bees, flies, and other ins ants, other insects uh, on those flowering heads. And I'm wondering if, um, say, the bees or the wasps would pass on anything they picked up in the in the pollen or nectar uh, to a bird or to some other animal that would eat them. Um, I don't know how much it takes, you know, to take out a bird. Who knows? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, you you've got different, such a different organism there. It's it's hard it's hard to say. Yes. Okay. Lots of thank yous. Uh, fascinating talks, especially about the plants that are in our backyard. There, the place that a lot of us birders go to. Very cool. Uh, I think yeah, that's it on on questions. Cool. Okay. Well. Well, thank you for the chance to to talk. I hope I I think I just made it under my deadline there. <laughs> I you would have done fine. I'd have, I'd have stopped time and you could have gone on. And but no, I really do appreciate you taking the time to to share with us uh, your vast knowledge of the of the plants out there. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier, I like to look at everything and and it's, it's like the Dunangia. When I first saw that, I went, "Wow, what is that?" Uh, you, you know, years ago, before I found it was done in India, it's really beautiful the feel. This, actually, it's the same feel that's uh, behind you. <laughs> yeah, the, the the one the one on the behind me is uh, yeah. is is off the east end of of uh, parking lot A. Right. Yeah. Okay. The, okay. But yeah, the one that was south. And I was coming. Uh, no, th this yeah. one's east because it's close to the causeway there. Yeah. Um, the one I showed earlier is south of parking lot A. Yeah. Um, and yes. it, it, you'll, you don't always get both sides of that blooming at the same, at the same year. Yeah. Another big fill was out there on, on that long road on the way to parking lot G to the west of that road. Yeah, there's, there's a spot down there. That's another place where I find the, the white variation. Uh, down in Glide Tool Ranch, there's uh, uh, as you're approaching the barn, there's a there's a, a slough there, and there's a large patch of it down there. Um, I'm hoping that'll come up this year. Okay, all righty, that's all the questions, and uh, I want to thank you again uh, for sharing your vast knowledge with us. And I'm going to start looking for some of these plants when I'm out there. And I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. Um, and um, Really appreciate you uh, taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, next month, uh, we have a, a talk on, on eBird. It's going to be, um, I would say, comfortable for all levels of folks. Um, I think that's what they're putting together. Uh, Emmett Iverson and Zane Pickus uh, will be presenting uh, next month. And in April, we're going to have a talk on the Yellow Audubon's phenology project at Bobcat Ranch to let us know. I think it started in 2016. So we'll see where we are today. And I think that's gonna be very interesting. Uh, thank you again. Anne, any closing comments? No, uh, although I would comment, Charlie, thank you. I learned so much. I, don't, I know nothing about plants, uh, but why doesn't Yellow Basin, you should be leading some trips out there besides vernal pools of the weeds or, uh, you know, there's so many things tonight that I saw that I, I've never noticed out there before. I'm, I'm going to tell Martha that she needs to have you doing more field trips. Well, I'm, I'm doing one at North Table Mountain uh, as part of the Explorer series, which is sold out. Um, yeah. We're doing. How we're, about Jepson Prairie? Can people go to those? Jepson Prairie, which which is um, south of Dixon, um, I'm a docent there. We're starting our public tours March 12th. Uh, they'll be every Saturday and Sunday at 10 o'clock, um, March 12th, hopefully through May 8th, through Mother's Day. But I'm not so sure that it's going to stay good that long this year unless we get yeah. some more rain. Um, it'll be much better this year than it was last year. There's a lot of water in the pond and uh, in the in the big pool, and there's flowers are blooming there now, um, just starting. But uh, I think the early March, um, all through March, it should definitely be good, and hopefully on into April. Okay. Uh, Charlie, I see one. Uh, Chrissy Deweese had one last question. She said, "Does uh, 
Charlie have a list of the plants included tonight? Um, if you email me at um, charlie at ibreakforwildflowers.com, um, I'll be happy to provide a, a, um, um, a, a, a copy, a PDF copy of the talk that we did. Great. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for coming. Excellent talk. Okay. Thank you. Good night, folks. <laughs>